can see it now. Yeah. So the first is uh, uh, the first guy on the constitution who was not really involved, but whose impact was absolutely tremendous because without these five elements, the constitution of India would not have been written or conceptualized. So he chose, so that is uh, the non-violence, the civil disobedience he got from Henry David Thoreau. And one interesting fact about Thoreau, when he went to Walden Pond to write his uh, thesis on uh, civil disobedience, he carried three books with him. And one of the three was the Bhagavad Gita. So the Bhagavad Gita <coughs> involved on the civil disobedience, Hattal, and the Advai Naroji on how the system works. And Leo Tolstoy on nonviolence. So, you know, in a sense, the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus was very much a part of our freedom movement because he came in through Gandhi. And that's the beauty of it. Women, womanhood and civilizing force in human society, he called it the civilizing force. So Maya and Malavika and Manju can be thrilled that you are the civilizing force in our society. And he said, means more important than the goal. It means are murky, the goal will be compromised. Now, on the last day of our uh, 2020 reunion, when most people had gone, I sort of went digressed greatly, but I'm not going to digress today because it's a long story about the Ramayana and Valmiki and how he mentioned that the means are more important than the goal. We can have another chat session on that. And strange thing, you know, about two weeks before he was assassinated, he made this comment, not once, but about five or six times to different people, that if I die of an illness, I will have proved a false Mahatma. But if I'm felled by an assassin's bullet, I would die with Ram's name on my lips and prove to be a true Mahatma. Why did he say it? We don't know. But he said it to at least five different people. And he went. So we come to, at the stroke of the midnight hour, when the world sleeps, India will wake to life and freedom. A moment comes which comes but rarely in history when we step out from the old to the new, from an age when an age ends and when a soul of a nation long suppressed finds utterance. It is fitting that at this solemn moment, we take the pledge of dedication to the service of India and her people and to the larger cause of humanity. So where were we? Where did we start? What was this constitution when we created the constitution? What were we about? So we had freedom after 250 years of colonial rule, economy reduced to half a percent of world trade, average lifespan, 32 years. Can you imagine 32 years? 12% literacy, 6% for women. We had 1,352 megawatts of power. 1943 Bengal famine wiped out 4 million dead, which is pretty close to Hitler's 6 million uh, Jews killed in the Holocaust. So then uh, <coughs> Winston Churchill wiped out 4 million in the Bengal famine, and the population was 350 million. Now, what do you do with a group like this? This is what we have when we have 1947, 15th August. So the Indian constitution, the story, the first person, <clears throat> Jawaharlal Nehru, and the intellectual inputs came from him. And it began with his nine years time spent in prison. Next to him is Ranjit Pandit, Vijayalakshmi's husband. He was an Oxford blue in tennis and uh, cricket. And during the prison days, he translated Kalidas's Meghdut and Kumar Sambhava from Sanskrit to English. That's what he did during his prison years. But Nehru had something else in mind when he went to prison. So he spent nine years, not like Mandela's 27 years at a stretch, but these were the days for his nine and a half years. And he said, I think the years I've spent in prison have been the most formative and important in my life because of the discipline, the sensations, but chiefly the opportunity to think clearly, to try to understand things. The entries in Nehru's prison journal. He wanted to give himself a home, a task, a homework, so that he would uh, vegetate in prison. And he gave himself three questions. Three questions which would take him nine years to reply. And lots of published written material. The first question was, what makes a civilization rise? 
what makes it fall? Second question was, why and when did India rise and why did she fall? And the third question was, how can we ensure that India never falls again? So he wrote <coughs> these in his <coughs> journal are in, in Murti Bhavan right now. So, but let's understand who is this guy? Where is he coming from? I mean, what is his mentality and how has it been shaped? So his tutor was a, a theosophist sent by Andy Besson. Uh, one day we could have a 20 minute session on theosophy and India and the Indian freedom movement and what is theosophy and the Upanishads. But Helen Blavatsky was the person and one of my heroines We've been to the Adyar Theosophical Society in um, uh, Madras. It's a fabulous place. But Annie Basan sent a tutor to Nehru in Anand Bhavan. And the strange thing is, 1885, this party was created by Alexander Octavius Hume, who was a theosophist. Five of the members were theosophists. 85% of the members who created the Congress Party. Now, there's a beautiful article by Professor uh, Mark Bevil of University of California, Berkeley, on theosophy and the origins of the Indian National Congress. It is unbelievable. <clears throat> and that's why we had to get our freedom before any of the colonial uh, states. Went to Harrow. And of course, uh, it was Winston Churchill's uh, alma mater. And I'll come back to that uh, later, but uh, it was considered the best school in the world at that time. Uh, in Harrow, one of the uh, somebody's uh, thing is still on, you know, uh, Mike. So one of the prize books he got was a book on Garibaldi. Now Garibaldi united the city-states of Italy. Somewhat like what India and, uh, uh, you know, uh, Patel did. Now, true, wrote down in his journal in Harrow, visions of similar deeds in India came before of my gallant fight for Indian freedom. And in my mind, India and Italy got strangely mixed together. So in school, he was already onto this unification idea of India. He goes to uh, college in Cambridge, Keys College, and uh, does science. <laughs> but he didn't study much of his uh, textbooks. What he did study was Keynes, Bertrand Russell, Meredith Townsend, Lowe's, Dickinson, A.G. Wells, and George Bernard Shaw, Fabian Socialism. That's what he was studying. And of course, he went to Temple in a Temple Inn and got his uh, call to the bar, did his law over there, which was considered. And there he met socialists like Beatrice Webb whom Rav Tata got to design Jamshedpur's welfare schemes. Who were Fabian socialists, very close to Sydney and Beatrice Webb, to uh, George Bernard Shaw. And he was called to the bar in 1912. Now, Nehru never in his entire life wore that outfit ever again, except once. Just once. And that was after the Second World War, when he wore it to defend the Indian National Army and Shubash Bose's soldiers, and he got them off scot-free. The British wanted to execute them. So that's the only time he put on his robes of uh, being a barrister. But other than that, this was the first and the last time that he wore his barristerial robes. Now, the ban, what was he reading? This is from a letter written to Indira from prison that he's talking about Plato and Republic, the Greek plays, Sophocles, Euripides, Aeschylus, Aristophanes, and Shakuntala and Kalidas in translation, Shakespeare, not for studying, but to read, Walt Whitman, Malavika and me had a discussion on Walt Whitman a few uh, weeks ago, and Browning, which he says are okay, but his favorite is Walter de la Mer, which we did in school. And he does talks about Tolstoy's War and Peace, Anna Karnina, Dickens, Thackeray, and he's talking of utopias. William Morris, News from Nowhere, Samuel Butler's Erwan, A.G. Wells, Men Like Gods, Bernard Shaw, Bertrand Russell. So these are the things he's advising Indira, read them. 
because they're important for creating your mind. Now, his first task, why do civilizations fall after they rise? To answer that simple question, one question which he put in the journal, he wrote glimpses of world history. It's about a thousand pages. And he wrote that from prison, all of it from prison. Now, the Kirkus Review in 1960 said, Nehru composed a masterpiece of historical condensation in a thousand page survey. Extraordinarily objective, his universalism, his moralism shine through. And he's talking of what? He's talking of this, this is from the last five pages of the glimpse of world history, where he's summing it up. Egypt, Babylon, Nineveh, Aryans, uh, Chinese, Knossos, Greece, Imperial Rome, Byzantium, Arabs, Maya and Aztec. He's gone through the whole lot. Mongols, Middle Ages, Gothic cathedrals, Mughal, Renaissance of learning, art in Western Europe, discovery of America, sea routes, Western aggression in the East, big machine, development of capitalism, industrialism, European domination and imperialism, wonders of science in the modern world. He's gone through everything, every single aspect of human existence till his time in prison. And he says, his finding is great empires have risen and fallen and been forgotten by man for thousands of years. But, and yet an idea, many a fancy has survived and proved stronger and more persistent than empire. So he's come down to the basic that empires rise and fall, but an idea can stay forever. And then he has some fun. He has a little bit of a joke with the reader, you know, and with Indira. So he quotes a poem of Mary Coleridge. This is all in the, <laughs> you know, uh, in his book, A Glimpse of the World History, the last few pages. Egypt's might is tumbled down, down and down the deeps of thought. Greece has fallen, Troy town. Glorious Rome had lost her crown. Venice pride is not, but the dreams that their children dreamed. Fleeting, unsubstantial, vain. Shadowy as the shadows seemed. Airy, nothing as they deemed. These remain. The dreams remain. And he goes to the negative side. This is the positive. And the negative side, he quotes Matthew Arnold. And Matthew Arnold at the end says, where ignorant armies clash by night. It's pointless. It's pointless whatever we do. Ignorant armies will clash by night and destroy it all. So is Nehru going to go with Mary Coleridge's positivism of ideas or Matthew Arnold that is pointless? So in the last page of Glimpses of World History, he chooses an Indian poet and an Indian poem to close his book. And the poem is Rabindranath Tagore. And the poem is where the mind is without fear and the head is held high. Where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken into fragments by narrow domestic walls where words come out from the depth of truth, where tireless striving stretches its arms towards perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the dreary desert sand of dead habit, where the mind is led forward by thee into ever widening thought and action, into the heaven of freedom, my father, let my country awake. That's the last page of Glimpse of the World History. Then he visits Tagore, has lengthy conversations with him. They are both universalist uh, people. And he sends Indira to Shantiniketan. And when Indira complains of the food, all of us complain of hostile food and wants to have a PG accommodation, he writes a letter to saying nothing doing. You will be in the hostel and have the hostile food. And there is Indira in Shantiniketan with Tagore. Basically, he wants that feeling, that entire thing to be into her. And that can't come by just reading. She has to live there. Now, his second question. He's looking at India. And where does India rise and where does she fall? And what is this India? You know, historians, particularly objective historians, said there was no concept of an end. And he said, Indian philosophical outlook, he said, if India lost her political freedom, then some sort of decay must have preceded. How can we define the process of decay? How can we, you know, say why did the decay happen? And he writes discovery of India from Ahmednagar Fort Prison. Just fires it off. 
and it concerns every single dynasty that has ruled India. And he's talking, this is from Discovery of India, that yet something has bound them together and binds them still, a cultural entity amidst diversity, a bundle of contradictions held together by strong but invisible threads. He says, she's a myth and an idea, a dream and a vision, and yet very real and present and pervasive. And when he finishes India, he says, how can we ensure that India never falls again? Which is his, the last question. That's what the whole exercise is about for nine years. Now, something very interesting happens. What Nehru is saying, I'm repeating it, what Nehru is saying and his analysis, his diagnosis of rise and fall is what 80%, 80% of all management development programs of Harvard, Kellogg, Stanford, I am Ahmedabad, I am Cal, I am Bangalore, XLRI, Tuft, Purdue, you name it, all of them concern themselves with. All of them. And his analysis is exactly the same corporate analysis which corporate consultants are presenting that if you don't do it, you die. And that's Nehru's analysis. He says, central lessons needed to be burnt into the consciousness of every Indian. He's saying progress was a law of life. A society must either progress or go under. It had no choice. Progress only if society encouraged. Now, these are the three critical things. Criticism, dissent, and creative experimentation. If you don't encourage these, you die. That's his analysis, having gone through every civilization in the history of mankind, every civilization in the history of India. He writes this in his journal. And he says this can only happen if a society was open, mobile, broadly egalitarian, democratic in its structure and ethos. That is what every professor of every management school everywhere in the world, from INSEAD and IIMD and London Business School, everywhere is propagating to corporates for the 21st century. It's Gary Hamill's uh, future of management. It is uh, Teresa Amabile's uh, thing, it's Clay Clayton Christensen, it's Dean Simonton, all the American, the things basically saying, if you don't do this, your organization is dead. And Nehru is saying that for civilization and for India. Now, he wants to wrap it up with an ethical mentor. So he's searching for an ethical mentor for India, for all of our future living. And he looks and he looks and he looks and he knows who, and he's found him. It's Ashoka. Now, modern historians call him among the top three leaders of all time in the history of the world, along with Elizabeth I and Louis XIV. Now, Ashoka was discovered by William Jones, who knew 28 languages, who came as head of the Indian Supreme Court, which was then based in Calcutta. And during the closure, he used to go to uh, uh, a place in a Mofasil, uh, Bengal, where he built a cottage and he learned Sanskrit and he translated all the, uh, 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 the Bhagavad Gita. He, trans he wrote a 17 page hymn to Narayan, holy, <laughs> not you, but basically William Jones, it's a long story. I won't get into that, how, how he brought Ashoka back because Ashoka was killed, literally killed, censored by Brahminical orthodoxy of India. And it was killed by the Muslim invasion of Nalanda University and all the Buddhist universities where they were wiped out. All the manuscripts were burnt. And it was killed by Christian missionaries who did not allow Warren Hastings and company to bring this up and stopped all funding of uh, William Jones and his uh, successors to bring Ashoka back. So you had between Brahminical Orthodoxy, Islamic uh, <laughs> movement and Christian uh, missionaries, all three combined to bring Ashoka into, put, lock him up in the cupboard and forget about him. Nobody knew who he was. Uh, Princet, who came as assay master of the mint in Calcutta, deciphered the Brahmi script. 
Jones discovered him, but Jones couldn't understand what the language was about. And he, he just was fox, but it took uh, Princep to discover the Brahmi script, break it up. And on that, Ashoka started speaking. When Ashoka started speaking, all his edicts and stone edicts located all over India started coming out. And then we understood what this man was about. And we collated it with things which were coming out from Sri Lanka, from China, from Peking, from all over the world and from a burn off in Paris. And what came out from the Kalsi edict of Alexander Cunningham, who was Princeps uh, disciple and successor, is mention of Antigonus II, Antiochus, Ptolemy, Magus, Alexander. We knew that these worlds were in touch with each other. And the three objects of worship of Ashoka, the Bodhi tree, the stupa, and the wheel of the moral law, the chakra. But what was he? Why is he important? He's considered the forerunner to United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, the Brotherhood of Man and World Peace, the first in the history of mankind animal rights declaration in the world, the first state declaration of conservation of nature, which is so important in today's global warming with uh, Joe Biden doing all that he can to bring America back. But this is absolutely Ashoka. And this is the greatness of Ashoka. And I'm going to take a little while to tell you why Nehru chose Ashoka, because it comes. This is from the book King of Ashoka, but also from Chicago University's uh, beautiful, beautiful uh, publication on the edicts of Ashoka, which is my source code. So first, nonviolence as a means of achieving ends, allowing conquest by dharma, freedom of religious expression with respect for the views of others, promotion of the essentials of all religions based on proper behavior, purity of heart, self-control, firm devotion, respect for each other, generosity, good deeds, gratitude, restraint, impartiality, non-injuring or harming others, forgiving those who do wrong where forgiveness is possible. Nehru had his mentor for ethics for secular India. And he made Ashoka the pillar, the chakra, the heart of Indian government, the four lions standing guard over chakras. The flag, which all of you know, Madam Bhikaji Kama designed and brought out in Stuttgart because there was an order of arrest at sight for her in India, had, didn't have the chakra in the center. Nehru put it in the center. So Bhikaji Kama's tricolor, a Parsi who designed the flag and Nehru's central Ashokan chakra. Now, the last part of Nehru's. He's looking for a political model. What, what's going to be India's political model? That this is the precursor to the, you know, the creation of the uh, constitution. He's got plenty of time. The British have given him nine years. So he starts searching. And the pictures I'm going to show you in black and white are from Ranjit, Arun, Malabika, all our American, these things, from the US House of Congress, the US House of Representatives. They're on the walls of the US House of Representatives from which I've taken from. So he looks at the Lichavis, 600 BC in India, who had a form of democracy. He looks at the Pala dynasty, 750 AD, who had a form of democracy. He looks at ancient Greece, but he spends a lot of time with Gilgamesh. This is from Washington DC, this picture in your House of uh, Representatives, which was on 6th of January invaded by certain people who didn't much care for democracy. But uh, I've taken the picture from there. But Gilgamesh, we studied him in school. And this is the tablet number 11, which Nehru spent a lot of time and trying to understand. Then he goes to Hammurabi. Again, we studied uh, Code of Hammurabi in school. And again, this black and white is from the House of Representatives, Washington, DC. He studies Lycurgus, Sparta, horrible, but total democracy. And total democracy <laughs> included kill any child which was not strong enough. Imagine the state of the mother, the state of the father, but that's what made Sparta so strong. But okay, he looks at Lycurgus. He looks at Solon, who's one of my favorites, and one of the seven sages of the ancient world, like our Saptarishis. And Solon's ideas of democracy and governance 
absolutely fantastic. Again, this picture is from uh, House of Representatives, uh, Washington, DC. Then he looks at the three philosophers. He looks at Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. Aristotle, of course, he does not agree with at all. Plato, partially, Socrates is interesting, but he throws Aristotle out because Aristotle talks of one man ruling. He looks at Cicero, does a lot of work on Cicero. He looks at uh, Diodorus Siculus, first century BC, who talked about where Rome was going wrong. And he studied Diodorus Sicula, Siculi because he wanted to find out where did Rome go wrong? Where was this uh, thing about the Republic of Rome and the Caesar, the concept of Caesar, where was it going wrong? And then, of course, he comes to the French Revolution and looks at Jean-Jacques Rousseau and the social contract. For the first time, somebody says, each one of us as human beings, we have a social contract with each other and the state, the country we live in. This concept of defining the social contract was very, very exciting. And the three people who came in, Hobbes, John Locke, and Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Now, he looks at Hobbes, which a lot of people today all over the world are following. Hobbes says, if everybody tries to give their opinion, there is chaos. So let me give up my rights. I give up my rights to the Leviathan. You can see the Leviathan. He's one man who controls everything. He's got the sword and the scepter and all the people are in his body and he's got the crown. So the Leviathan is the best way. That's Aristotelian way. We all give up our rights. We will not decide right or wrong. One man will decide and he knows best. Give it to him. Let him go. Okay, there'll be mistakes, but let it be. It's better than chaos. Against that, the other end of the spectrum was John Locke. I want to keep my rights. People can make good decisions. Governments get power from the consent of the people. People had nature, natural rights, life, liberty, property. Governments are created to protect people's natural rights. If a government fails, then what Gandhi and uh, uh, this thing said, uh, uh, that people have the right to overthrow that government. So the Hartal is genuine. Now, a lot of these I got also from Aspen when I was there. We had to study Locke and we had to study these. So I owe all this to my Aspen days. Now, this is interesting from Locke. He says, whenever the legislators endeavor to take away and destroy the property of the people or to reduce them to slavery under arbitrary power, they put themselves into a state of war with the people who are thereupon absorbed from any further obedience and are left to the common refuge which God had provided for all men against force and violence. So when you look at farmers for three uh, months, they're following John Locke. They're not following the Leviathan. They are basically following Locke's philosophy. And then my favorite, Thomas Paine, the father of the American Revolution. A uh, little digression, because we are all from Calcutta in some way or the other. Uh, Thomas Paine's banned books, The Rights of Man and Rights of Reason, were smuggled into Calcutta in the 19th century against British norms. They were, it was instigated by Henry de Rosio. That's the stamp which the government of India brought out for Henry de Rosio. The Young Bengal movement was created, a revolution in art, mathematics, science, religion, intellectual growth, and the Bengal Renaissance. I'll, I'll not get into that, but it's a small direction. Paine was a uh, important figure for the Bengal Renaissance. But Paine says, you will do me the justice to remember that he always strenuously supported the right of every man to have his own opinion, however different that opinion might be to mine. He who denies to another this right makes of himself to his present opinion a slave because he precludes the self the right of changing it. The most formidable weapon against errors of every kind of uh, mistake, error, is reason. I have never used any other, and I trust I never shall. Nehru looks at Madison. He looks at Jefferson. The greatest danger to American freedom is government that ignores the Constitution. He looks at the American Constitution, which says we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain 
unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. He looks at the French Declaration of Rights of Man, 1789, and then he has to take a decision. So all over the world, people are talking, which way would they go? Everybody's saying he'll go the way of the Leviathan because that would be the best. Remember what I showed you as the first slide, 6% women educated, 12% is the average. Mo said a country with 12% literacy, extreme poverty, 90% landless. You must remember John Adams was against Madison and uh, Jefferson for the constitution. He said anybody who does not own property does not have the right to vote. Of course, the blacks and the women were also denied. But for among men, John Adams was very clear. If you don't have the uh, property, you can't vote. Now, 90% are landless. They would not survive in any other political model, at least in the initial years of freedom. So which way will Nehru go? Is it going to be a Russo social contract movement? Is it going to be a Jeffersonian freedom movement? Is it going to be a Hitler Leviathan moment? Is it going to be a Stalin dictatorship of the proletariat moment? And it was something which the world go really, really. I mean, the amount of material which is there, where will Nehru go? Which way will Nehru go? Nehru goes with John Locke and Thomas Paine. Honor the natural rights of man. India must be secular. Society must be egalitarian and allow dissent. The constitution has to be a working document for change, upholding values, and not a statement of philosophy like Jefferson and Madison. We had, uh, you know, uh, untouchables. If uh, uh, Holy will bear this out uh, later in the discussions, if Ayanga Brahman's, uh, you know, untouchable shadow fell on Ayanga Brahman, he'd have to have a bath. He had to have a bath. You know, we were really, really stratified. So he said, I've got to make the constitution a document for social change. And I cannot have it as a philosophical outpouring of all that I've uncovered. So he's searching for a writer. Who will write it? Who will create this document? Who's the engineer? So you've got the spiritual guy who's given you certain background philosophical things of what India should be in terms of philosophy. You've got the intellectual guy who's gone through nine years of looking at the world, India, but you need somebody to implement it. Who's going to implement it? Who's going to put it into practice? Who's going to write it and make sense of it? It's Ambedkar. Now, Ambedkar, I'm going to show you the thing, but he comes from an untouchable family in Pune. But because his father is a sepoy, in the British Indian Army, he's allowed to go to school. He's allowed. But in the school, he can't enter the classroom. He has to, they, he and his brothers and sisters in the various classes, they have to sit in the corridor and peep inside. There's only a Mali, who, the lowest caste, who can give them water. If that Mali is on leave, they can't even get water in school. He comes first in class and graduates. And he goes to Elphinstone. And he comes first there. He's paid for by Gaikwad of Baroda, the, the uh, uh, Maharaja of Baroda. And from uh, there, he goes to Columbia. He does his MA in Columbia. In uh, Elphinstone at Bombay University, he comes first. In Columbia, he uh, graduates summer come lord, PhD from Columbia University. He does an MA from London School of Economics, where he comes first again. He does a doctorate in London University in economics, and he's called to the bar at Gray's Inn in London. Now, he comes back to India, no job. But he gets a post in Sydenham College, where he's given a separate table and a separate earthen water, uh, the sink for drinking water. He can't touch anybody else's uh, thing because he's untouchable. But people keep coming to him. And he becomes principal of the Bombay Law College, which is the best college in India for law at that time. And he becomes a practicing barrister at Bombay High Court. The Muslims, the untouchables, the British, the non-Brahminical Hindus all come to him. And he's a crusader against untouchability. Nehru calls him. And 29th August, 1947,
He's appointed chairman of the drafting committee. Every evening, the Nehru was in Delhi. Ambedkar had to report the progress and status. So there were state banquets or state dinners, and Ambedkar would be sitting in a sofa outside and dozing. At 11, 11.30 at night, Nehru would come out, and then they would discuss what was the progress. 50 academics were worked, in, uh, worked with him in support. The academics were chosen from every state in India. They stayed in Constitution House. That building housed all the top brass of the Allies during the Second World War. The generals, the lieutenant generals, the major generals, the brigadiers. And after the Second World War, it was empty. It was made into a Constitution House, and the 50 people stayed there. Background reference, Constitution of USA, UK, Ireland, USA, USA, Canada, France, the Weimar Republic, which given to them. And this is a little cartoon from at that time, where Ambedkar is on a snail, and Nehru with a whip trying to <laughs> make him go faster. It, it, it's a cartoon from 1948. The Indian Constitution, which Ambedkar and the team produced, is the longest in the world. Nehru asked artist Nandalal Bose, from Shantiniketan to paint and supervise the beautifully calligraphed original. Artists from Nobel laureate Tagore Shantiniketan painted the borders with most. The paintings reflect from Mahindradaro till the present. Every aspect of India history from Mahindradaro to Nandalal Bose and his uh, team painted it. The calligraphy was a person chosen as the best calligrapher in India, Prem Bihari Narayan Razda. The Constitution of India came into force on 26th of January, 1950, when India ceased to be a dominion and we became a sovereign democratic republic. That's the Constitution. Those are the paintings. And the paintings and the edges and the borders go back to Mahindradaro. And their kindness the ethics and grace created this document. And the search, the search concerned every dimension of civilization. As a result of this, a fallout, a strange fallout, was Burton Russell, E.M. E. Foster, and 50, 48 others, 50 signatories. And Lord Mountbatten was a signatory named Nehru as a chancellor of Cambridge University. <laughs> he, he said that, you know, my countrymen would never accept that me becoming a chancellor of the imperial uh, Raj's uh, best university. With great difficulty, Krishna Menon was an Indian high commissioner in UK, a lot of letters, and he had to get his nomination withdrawn. But the fact that to make you understand what is the chancellor of Cambridge University, just one college, the Trinity College, when Amartya Sen became the principal, the, his appointment letter had to be signed by John Major and Queen Elizabeth. It was signed by the Prime Minister of UK and the Queen. But the Chancellor of Cambridge University is far beyond that. And that was the honor given to Nehru. Now, after 72 years, where are we? This is a little dated because this is 2018. We have 1350 million population. Lifespan has gone to 68 years per capita income $2,100, power generation third largest in the world, literacy rate 74%, which was 12% in 47, IT second in the world, space highest satellite launchers in 2017, the best Mars project, nuclear almost self-sufficient, steel second highest in the world after China, but the big gap between us and China, food grains self-sufficient, but very poor distribution, milk largest producer in the world, stock exchanges are vibrant. What are the challenges? Poverty of 20% who are called below poverty line, BPL. Healthcare among BPL. Gender is a problem. Corruption is a problem. Infrastructure is a problem. Overloaded judiciary is a problem. 10% plus unemployment is a problem. Drinking water in some states is a problem. Quality of primary education in rural areas is a problem. That's Barack Obama addressing the Indian parliament. India is a founding member of the International Institute for Democracy. We are consultants to various countries. We offer uh, consultancy to United Nations and democracy. In the 2014 elections, as I said, this is a little dated, 814 million voters, and our elections are far faster than the American elections. 
larger than the European Union and USA combined. We spend six point, we have 6.6 .6 million government and civil employees who are employed for the elections. And we spend $5 billion, which is second only to US's 7 billion in 2012. But what is interesting now is this whole process of democracy. We've gone through Rousseau and, uh, you know, Hammurabi and Gilgamesh and uh, uh, Locke and Hobbes and uh, Aristotle and Plato and, you know, e everybody under the sun. But currently, the University of Gothenburg does a major, major study of democracy. Their June 2018 concerned these countries for democracy. And they said that 2.6 billion people have backslid away from democracy. And those 24 countries are USA, Brazil, Hungary, Brazil, uh, Russia, India, Poland, Turkey, you know all of them. All of us know all of them and we know why. So these are my reference books that I used. One of the best books was uh, Sarvapali Radhakrishnan's son, uh, you know, his uh, Sarvapali Gopal's uh, three volume book on Nehru. Also, all his journal entries are from Legacy of Nehru, a Sentinel Assessment by uh, D.R. Sardesai. All the journal entries are there for the uh, thing. And I loved Stanley Wolpert's Nehru from which I've taken a lot of things. So the journey continues. Thank you.